Partnership, which both underwrites and inspires our work. Attendees of this webinar are from the OCLC RLP, and I want to thank you for your continued um, input into our work, uh, which uh, helps to move us forward and is really, truly critical to our success. Um, before uh, I turn things over to Ben Harry, I am going to invite uh, my colleague, Chela Weber, to kick things off with us with a, with a few words. Take it away, Chela. Thanks, Marilee. Um, and good morning, everyone, uh, or good morning from the west coast of the United States. Um, I'm Chela Scott Weber. I'm a senior program officer here at OTLC, the Research Library Partnership. Um, and my work here for the RLP focuses on supporting learning and research related to archives, special and distinctive collections. Um, some of you may know who've seen one of our uh, webinars before, OCLC has a long history of work in the area of archives, special and distinctive collections and research libraries. And we work in special collections because we know that they're an important site of knowledge creation uh, that's made possible by the library's commitment to the stewardship of those collections. And we know that the unique nature of the material in special collections can make scaling work a challenge. So we work to identify areas of common need and patterns of innovation to help uh, our member libraries scale learning and expertise with these collections. Um, in October of 2008, we released the Research and Learning Agenda for Archives Special Distinctive Collections, um, which was created through a participatory community process with Archives and Special Collections community and is now guiding work, our work in this area. It articulates some shared challenges and opportunities research li libraries are facing in special collections uh, and, and suggests approaches on it, um, for us to work on them together. So one of, uh, one of the key priorities identified through the research agenda process is, um, uh, is working on stewarding our AV collections. Um, AV holdings continue to be a top concern in archival repositories because of the evolving modes of scholarship in which these are increasingly valuable and sought after resources um, because of the preservation concern that many formats are at or near end of life and because the volume of AV holdings is really staggering and exceeds many institutions' ability to do preservation reformatting. Um, we've been working uh, over the last year or so to better understand needs in this area uh, beyond our initial conversations and the creation of the agenda. So we did a survey um, of 137 different colleagues in the RLP participated in the spring of 2019 and then continued to have um, community conversations throughout that year and then wrote some blog posts summarizing what we learned through those activities. And now, we're uh, responding to what you all told us you need. We're doing this series of webinars throughout 2020. Um, and one of the key takeaways for me from the survey and the subsequent conversations was that we really need to rethink our traditional approaches to AV in order to tackle the problem in front of us. Um, the preservation risks coupled with the large volume of AV holdings in the short time window really means that we must scale up our work with these collections. And working at scale amplifies the challenges of AV materials like uncertain copyright or lack of detailed descriptive information. And it also creates new challenges. I think there are all kinds of different ways that a shift in mindset will be necessary to addressing the challenges of stewarding AV collections at scale. So for our webinar series, we're asking partners from um, from different RLP institutions who are working at scale and addressing different aspects of work with AV to share their work and the ways that that has challenged and shifted their mindset and ways of working. Um, so today, uh, I'm really excited to uh, that Ben Harry has um, agreed to, to talk to us about the work that he's been leading at BYU. Um, I think it's really practical, it's really principled, and um, and we all have a lot to learn from Ben. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Thank you. I would like to thank Chella, 
Marilee and Mercy for allowing me to present and helping me to get this pre presentation ship shape and Bristol fashion. I sincerely hope that this will be useful to those participating today or viewing this webinar later. I have created this presentation for the manuscript archivist or librarian who may have to deal with audiovisual materials found in their collections. I found a great deal of information and support for dealing with audiovisual materials available, but much was directed towards an audiovisual archivist who might be working in an archival environment that specializes in these collections or works primarily with these types of materials. As I continue with these projects, I realized I also certainly could be more well-read. I regularly find more and more resources from which to draw, and many of these would have helped with this process. But I would present our experience here, and my goal for this presentation is to be a bridge between the very specialized world of AV archiving and those with a traditional archives background, and see if we can't demystify some of this for archives and archivists working in broader manuscript contexts. My presentation style is not to have the exact same content in my slides as I read in my presentation. I hope you don't find this style maddening, but I simply cannot abide reading a PowerPoint. So I apologize if this is difficult to digest. At least it will be available later where you can pause the recording when the visual is not matching what I am saying. I would also like to quickly establish how I will refer to audiovisual recordings. I use the term content for the audiovisual intellectual content fixed in video or audio signals and the term carrier to describe the physical audiovisual item that has a specific format. The carrier's format and its contents are somewhat inseparable because the format has such a great impact on the content, but since these carriers are at risk of physical deterioration and format obsolescence, we will talk about each one separately and refer to the process of maintaining one without the other. I am also sure that I will annoyingly refer to AV and audiovisual interchangeably. To provide you with some background to the situation we are facing, I will tell you a little bit about the L. Tom Perry Special Collections, nested within the library, located at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. At last count, the Special Collections has approximately 12,000 manuscript collections and over 86,000 individual containers in those manuscript holdings. As many of these manuscript holdings are from the 20th century, some type of audiovisual carriers are included within a majority of the collections. How we specifically divide the duties in our special collections is by assigning curators stewardship duties over specific collecting areas, which are typically defined by time period, 19th and 20th and 21st century. The curators certainly work with donors to acquire collections, but their duties also include the shepherding of the materials once acquired through the subsequent processing and preservation stages, and then the promotion of those collections. Due to our significant collections, which document cinema, radio, journalism, and television, I curate a unique subject-based manuscript collecting area designated as media arts history. I then have a second responsibility as the curator of audiovisual materials. This newly created position was designed to facilitate the sustainable preservation and access to the information contained on all audiovisual carriers found in special collections and support the various manuscript curators in prioritizing preservation decisions in their collection stewardship. When I was hired in 2018 to this position, it was apparent that to effectively engage with the collections, I would require a sufficient level of detail regarding the types and amounts of audiovisual materials found in the stacks, of which there was no current specific record. My professional background is in audiovisual archiving. A graduate of the Emeritus Moving Image Archive Studies program at UCLA, I began with motion picture film archiving and then branched out to include video and audio formats through my work as the media archivist at the National Baseball Hall of Fame and working in the National Audiovisual Conservation Center of the Library of Congress in Culpeper, Virginia. With this background and in my new duties as a manuscript archivist, I recognize that there is AV present in just about every manuscript collection, but that there is not always a great deal of crosstalk 
between paper-based archival discussion and the audiovisual archiving community, which typically engages with others within this specialization or focuses on media-only collections. This situation leaves a great deal of AV material under the purview of archivists who might not be terribly comfortable or experienced in working with audiovisual materials. This situation has the potential to intimidate and result in hesitation when engaging with these materials. And I was hoping that I could provide a place to start with this presentation and my recently published article on this effort. I think that between the two, my article and this presentation, a person could gain some insight into what we did at BYU, why we did it, and hope this might dispel some of the uncertainty and trepidation that can arise from finding pockets of AV in manuscript collections. As it is with my position, as I am sure many of you do the same, I wear multiple hats, and my time and resources were very limited, having only a few hours a week to dedicate to the locating, describing, and assessing of all AV found in the collections. So the pressing questions I had were, where is the AV hiding in this sea of Hollinger boxes, and how am I going to find and identify it in a reasonable manner? Our manuscript collections are primarily arranged in original order, seeking to preserve some relational insight regarding how these disparate elements could have been contextually connected by their creator. They live on compact shelving that covers about a football field of space underground in the library. As I walked up and down these aisles, I found some obvious AV materials, but it was mostly archival boxes and cartons. I knew that AV lurked in here, and I needed to search it out. I knew many containers would have paper only, and I also knew that many containers exclusively housed AV only. And then there were some where it was mixed in together. I could start to see the road before me stretching out, and I imagined the task of pulling all 86,000 containers in front of me. I needed to find a way to avoid opening every single container myself and documenting what I found. And my first thought was to turn to the records, finding aids, and databases to lead me to the hidden AV. Some of our finding aids are only available in holdover physically printed and bound finding aids. Some are online in our new archive space application. And some are in the various formulations we have progressed through in the last 20 years, like some XML documents, WordPerfect files, and such things. Some collections have good descriptions, but many are not up to date. Many just have a container near the end described as AV materials. These often have some formats and counts, but these are hit and miss and often inaccurate. We also have some descriptions that hint at the presence of AV materials, such as oral history, but it wasn't clear whether this was a typed transcript, an analog recording, or just what exactly. At times, AV items were described as tapes, and this was just lacking the specificity I was looking for. Finally, even the best case scenario was a detailed listing of the contents of a container. Yet the title of the items were simply what was written on them, such as tape six or erba de gati were, which wouldn't be of much help to a researcher. It is simply the nature of AV materials that to discover and describe them, they need a machine for playback. There is no scanning with the eye that, can do, that we can do with paper docs looking at just the top of the pages or flipping through a folder to verify that these are all meeting minutes in chronological order, or even looking up folder tabs in a container to get a feel for what type of documents are kept therein. So it is understandable that these would be simply described by what is written on the physical carrier, which was absolutely at the mercy of the creator of the records or manuscripts. As we know, databases are only as valuable as the information that is entered. We are inheriting a legacy where not everything is entered into the computer da databases, and really it has only been the last 25 years that we have been doing this. I have been here over two years and haven't made much headway on our backlog, so I am the last person who can cast stones. And this is a common situation that many of us find ourselves in. 
The means we had for access to these audiovisual items was through some legacy playback equipment in the reading room. Here a pa patron could play back VHS, audio cassette, and DVD or Blu-ray discs. This isn't ideal because the playback of analog recordings inherently wears out the material, and it also presents the possibility of catastrophic damage and loss if the tape gets destroyed or the disc gets scratched. Irregular maintenance on the equipment and untrained operation by a patron, staff, or faculty could result in the partial or complete loss of the original material. In this, there is a justified reason to hesitate when access accessing AV materials. Machines can be quite destructive, even when a person does have a good deal of experience. I had a belt in a machine break just a few months ago, and it resulted in some crinkling of the tape as I had to manually extract the media carrier from the machine before I could repair it. So once again, I'm not pointing fingers of blame or shame on those who have hesitated when dealing with these. But the truth is also that technology has developed far enough that we now have sufficiently robust digital technology and established guidelines for standards that aid us in the preservation and access of these materials. And these materials do have expiration dates. There is ample motivation to get these materials safely digitized for access and preservation purposes sooner than later. <clears throat> these recordings are at risk. Although this opinion here on this slide is a little too soon in my estimation, the National Film and Sound Archive of Australia predicts that content stored on magnetic media only has until the middle of the decade to be widely recoverable. Now, I don't believe it will be absolutely unrecoverable, but it is no stretch of the imagination to foresee these materials becoming more expensive to transfer through boutique audiovisual transfer facilities. Presently, there is still a good amount of this analog equipment out there, and quite a few vendors offer services of transfer. But these will diminish over time. So now is the time to deal with these materials. While the markets support keeping costs lower and before things become too fragile or cost prohibitive to transfer. When I started the Library of Congress in 2009, we were digitizing in a production environment that preserved audio and video at an amazing scale. Here we were 10 years later in 2018, and at BYU we hadn't really engaged in such a systematic program, so I felt it was time to get us up to speed. With a sense of urgency and with so many decisions dependent upon the knowledge of what we actually had, it was a high priority to capture this information. Here I am thinking of grant seeking, personnel hiring, building out our own AV transfer capabilities, and so forth. So many of these essential decisions hinged on getting some good data about what exactly we have in our collection. So in review, I wanted to start our AV assessment last week, yesterday, or even a month ago. I had 86,000 containers to go through, and I had roughly one or two hours a week to dedicate to it. Sound familiar? Probably so. In fact, I was so eager that I jumped right into the process and in hindsight might have even forced the issue a bit hastily, but I thought if I could get immediate feedback, I could adjust as we went along. But I just had to get started. I love gathering information and coming up with well thought out principles which drive practices, but I really wanted to avoid having things stall this assessment. I felt I could trust my experience and instincts if I made sure to watch things closely, check back, and thoughtfully review the feedback I would receive. Contacting our physical stacks manager, I found that he employed six students that help him manage the physical stacks. We had a regular process in place where those students would visit each box in the entire manuscript area and verify what is on each shelf location, as well as peek inside containers to identify potential conservation issues. We call it an annual shelf read, but the time frame isn't quite always so exact. It is like painting the Golden Gate Bridge. Just when you finish, it is time to start again. When I began talking with him, he had just recently restarted this effort only a week or so before which led to my hurried attempt to piggyback onto this procedure and adjust on the fly. So the students were starting in Bay 11 of the manuscript stacks that week. That very Thursday, I quickly took over the following meeting, weekly training meeting, to present to the students examples of audiovisual carriers and the project as a whole. 
I sold them on the value of content on AV carriers. I taught them to appreciate the last century of machine-readable formats, and I presented them with a visual guide of most common formats to aid in the identification of AV formats they would encounter. The project design had to answer some essential questions. Due to my experience in audiovisual archives, I knew that there was only so much information a person can glean from a physical inspection. I had participated in AV assessments in the past. There are some tools available that can really help a person wrap their minds around the considerations one needs to have in mind when inspecting and assessing media. I had attempted these types of actions before and tried to capture as much data as possible. Here are some really here are some examples of really nice systems that allow one to describe the conditions of an individual AV carrier in significant detail. In my previous experience, I found that after I had spent many of my own and or others' hours filling these fields out, that by and large, I ignored them when we actually reached the point of digitization. Although it might be listed on the carrier how long the recorded, the recorded content was thought to have been, anecdotally, I would report that almost half the time it was incorrect. So the granular data from these assessments was more of a suggestion than reliable data. Also, I wasn't exactly looking for granular at this time. I was looking for more numerical scale data across the entire repository. And these tools didn't offer the shortcuts I knew I needed to take. It can be very kind, time consuming using a tool such as Facet to describe a box of cassettes. Sometimes you have a box of 96 cassettes. AV assessment tools usually want a description of each item so that it can compile that data and it could tell you how many items you have suffering from mold or how many items you had of one recording configuration. All great data that can yield powerful reports. But in this situation, it just made more sense to use math and determine that a container had 96 audio cassettes in it and we could move on. If we count rows of four by 12 stacked up too high, that was 96 audio cassettes. What if they are stacked a little funny underneath and there's actually only 90 or even 100? To me, these were acceptable discrepancies. Rather than take the time to count them all out, since we are all, since we are talking about containers in the thousands and AV items in the hundred thousands, I was focused on, focused on rounding, rounded large numbers for decision making. So even if I came out with a total number for a format type, it is 100 items off for some of these most common formats, I was going to be okay. As far as conservation issues go, it is common to find these issues at the container level. If one single cassette in a given box has mold issues, then usually the whole box did. So I felt comfortable recording these at the container rather than the item level. As I reviewed my own past experiences and the new project before me, and knowing that these student workers probably had little contact with specific AV materials, I cut the data fields to be gathered to such a small unit that it surprised me. What I needed was a count of each format in each physical container. That was it. What is the format in the container and how many are there? That was enough for me to make analyses that could inform in-house digitization initiatives, personnel requests, and would facilitate the solicitation of grant funds for preservation. In my mind, I thought of the MPLP approach and how it had the potential to liberate from lengthy processing to prioritizing making materials available to patrons more quickly by letting go of the desired level of granularity that so many of us crave to give our collections. Addressing point number one, Due to the physical format, an urgency is inherent with these materials. I would count these materials as being needful and deserving. Addressing point number two, yes, that is the minimum essential that balances getting the necessary data required. I really needed to apply a razor to this question of what I needed and what I felt comfortable extrapolating from the gathered information. Number three, Okay, that was my goal from the beginning. The key terms are most usable and briefest. And to point four, well, this also inspired me to just jump right in and adjust as we go along rather than spend too much time deliberating about possible scenarios and get some real ones to adapt to. Okay, so MPLP was 
all about not doing things at the file level. And indeed, I recognize that each AV item needs to be handled individually when digitizing and describing. As in all reality, AV items most commonly require item level description, which would seem to go against the application of MPLP practices as we usually apply them. And I was looking for the macro view of what I had in the special collections as a whole. AV already gives us headaches at times when thinking in traditional organizational levels as an audiovisual carrier can be understood as its own intellectual content container, as a myriad of recordings can be stored on one single carrier. So I truly try to apply the spirit of the principles rather than the letter, and holding fast to these principles did provide useful clarity in approaching some of the more difficult discussions. The desired result would allow me to not only compile a report on the numbers and data that would drive decisions, but I could present a curator with a list of AV item counts and formats found in a specific collection broken down by container level. This would be a great step to enabling us to collaboratively address our audiovisual holdings. So I gave the students a few weeks to work through Bay 11, and this is what I got back. Hmm, yes, I was getting a collection call number identification, a physical container, and a location. But, oh boy, did I need to provide some better training. What qualifies as media? Uh, how would I categorize a floppy disk? It requires a machine to get at its information, but is it media? Is it audiovisual? I needed to define for myself and the workers more specifically what we were looking for and how to identify this in the report. One of the first things I realized that I, is that I needed to improve the way I teach the identification of AV materials, particularly in light of the fact that my audience had no experience with these. This led me to conceptually change how I trained the identification of these materials. I re reordered the AV guide that I created and created a, a taxonomic approach pointing out that we needed to be more specific in our descriptions for the data to be useful. I broke them down into groups of grooved media, magnetic media, optical media, and transparent film. Then I demonstrated how specific identification within these genus could be performed. While I was doing this training, I saw some students' eyes glaze over and I knew I had lost them. On the other hand, I had one student who sat forward on the edge of her seat and she started asking questions and independently inspecting the examples I had brought. It was at that point that the light in my head turned on. I was asking a lot of some of these students who had no interest in retro AV formats to try and learn and remember all of these variant formats. I also had calculated that if our initial findings held up to extrapolation, just from that Bay 11, that up to 75 or even 80% of our AV holdings were in just five of our most common formats. These were VHS, standard audio cassettes, optical discs, gramophone discs, and quarter inch open reel audio. If I could get the majority of the students to correctly identify just those five types and to know enough to recognize AV items that were not one of these five, then they could move through the process quite quickly and identify much of what they came across. You see, if the audit became too daunting, they would likely get discouraged, maybe avoiding the AV step altogether, or even prohibitively slowing down the shelf read so the collection manager wants to remove this aspect. I had to face it <clears throat> that as much as I love audiovisual technology, this was a topic they may have no natural interest in. All of us, when we are engaged in something we find fascinating, will increase our efficiency and energy and on the flip side, we can get discouraged, confused, and bored with things we don't really care about. These students weren't archival studies students. They were marketing, business, engineering, dramatic arts, or students of music. This was an on-campus job that they would have for a few years until they could find something more related to their studies and careers of choice. So in the middle of this training meeting, I already began to adapt the process in my mind. After the meeting, I spoke with the collections manager make sure it was okay for me to approach this particularly interested student, which it was, and we came up with this new approach. Five of the six students 
we'd complete the shelf read as normal, but adding an audiovisual identification column. They would identify the five most common formats specifically and provide a numerical count per format per container. If they could identify eight items as AV, but they weren't one of those base five, they could just record that there was that many AV items. This interested student would not perform the shelf read as the others would, but would take those hours earmarked for the shelf read each week and dedicate them to going through containers already identified as containing AV. She would verify formats and counts, and using the AV guide, be able to specifically identify more obscure formats. I would only need to audit a few containers a week that she had already checked to make sure she was identifying things correctly, and if anything was particularly questionable to her, she just flagged it in yellow for me to inspect myself. My one hour a week that I could dedicate to this project would now become much more efficient and meaningful. The final result that was, was that from <clears throat> November of 2018 to March of 2020, so under a year and a half, we had a first pass of all 86,000 containers. Now we had collection identification, container location, and a line item for each format type. I have outlined here how one physical container, carton eight, of MSS 2225 had 13 cassettes, four VHS, and 11 optical discs contained therein. This illustrates how we handle multiple format types within a single physical container. We were able to compile the data across entire bays, breaking down data by format type and by collecting area. We could also easily compile that data from all bays and across all collecting areas to have our composite data for the special collections. It took the five only about until July 2019, which is eight months, to perform their initial audit. And then the AV specialist left employment here, and when I found another who finished the work, we finished up our first AV audit in December of 2019. So it took just over a year, but I'm sure we could have done it in even less time without the turnover of the AV specialist. From these findings, I was able to compile and synthesize the data, write up a report on the state of AV in the special collections. Based upon those numbers, I was able to propose some recommendations to library administration. <clears throat> and these are the main recommendations I included in the report. I asked for a commitment to the digital storage of the content in digital form to help the administration understand the scale that such an undertaking would result in, both an estimated total as well as an estimated yearly requirement. I was also able to use data to back up the request for an in-house preservation effort. I received quotes for the transfer of our major holdings from outside vendors and could compare those costs to my estimations of in-house digitization. Not only would it be a huge savings, but it would involve students in the transfer of these materials, providing them with employment and experiential learning opportunities. The AV assessment documentation has taken on a life of its own in helping us take further steps in these processes. The initial question we had after generating a list of what exists was to ask what items to digitize first. If we were indeed facing these timelines of inability to preserve the content on these carriers, then some content might be relegated to not being preserved. How do I make selections of what to prioritize? How could I make this assessment work with the minimum amount of reinvention for the next step? So during the time that the assessment was in process, I was reviewing reports and documentation to come up with a risk rating system for each format type. Some of this rating is guesswork because the newest formats haven't been around long enough to broadly fail yet. There isn't a great amount of data on some of these. Also, each collection seems to present its own unique challenges and had its own unique storage history. There are a lot of different opinions out there. 
And on different days, I myself had different feelings about these formats and their prospects for longevity. Added to that fact, <clears throat> added to that is the fact that some of these formats were likely already cost prohibitive. Unless we could identify and champion content, that was of the highest priority. But the risk of feeling like I was reading tea leaves that kept moving about in my cup, I came up with a rubric to assign a value to each format, considering its fragility, as well as its risk of obsolescence. Now, I just mentioned that some of these formats are very expensive to transfer, such as two-inch video quad machines. But at least now that we know where they are located, and curators and subject specialists can look at these specifically and determine if the content is worth putting together a proposal for. There are going to be tough decisions to make, but now we can move forward from a place of information. Some of these are subjective for our, our institution, so please, you are welcome to look over ours as a reference, but also understand that we have a dry climate here, that our storage situation is robust, and mold is thankfully not something we have to battle with, as many others do. And I took these account, into account, these types of considerations when compiling these. Also, these are subject to change. If I find greater difficulty in transferring one of these formats than anticipated, I will move it up the scale. These are initial rankings and subject to further experience. Also, each collection has its own history, and these are gross general generalizations for each format type. The second side of the prioritization coin was that of content. I didn't want to spend all our time preserving materials solely based upon their format. I needed to mine the specialized knowledge of the curators and subject specialists in identifying collections that were in most need of preservation or were most commonly utilized by patrons. I knew the curators were busy, so I just asked them to rank the collection as a whole, not requiring them to inspect the collection's holdings individually. Certainly some collections warrant such a close review, <clears throat> but curators often know their collection so well, it simply takes a moment for them to consider how to evaluate content at the collection level. To offer my support in this process, I made a suggestion rubric to facilitate the curator coming up with an evaluative rank for each collection's content. So here is the list of my suggestions. The single most influential question I felt was whether the material was unique. If the curator believes us to have the only surviving rec recording, then it needs to be a three or above. And no matter how well used it was, it would only garner two if they believe it could be found elsewhere. Specific requests by curators and patrons drive much of our preservation efforts. But this value was an effective tool to drive the systematic digitization when requests are slow. As I mentioned earlier, completing this assessment has allowed us to make decisions based upon data and has provided direction in our actions. During the time of this assessment process, I also began the oversight of a media digitization lab here in the library. We had inherited a good amount of audio equipment for such transfers, and we had some funding for student labor. So we put together some suites where this preservation could take place immediately. Even while this assessment was still in process, we began the prioritized digitization of our holdings. As soon as the first phase report was complete, and I had my risk and content matrices in place, we were able to prioritize the preservation of these materials for at least one specific day. This began in April of 2019, just a few months into this project. During this time, we were able to purchase some needed equipment and begin the build out of our video preservation suites and base decisions upon the data we had gathered. We could really hit the ground running as soon as we had our equipment tested and ready, we could begin working with prioritized projects to work out the kinks of the workflow. And indeed, the assessment documents have become our entire preservation workflow roadmap. Our preservation is driven by patron research requests, curator requests, 
and then the values that we have established in these columns on the assessment sheet is now where we keep track of preservation completion. Project size is typically performed by container for a manageable project to engage with in the lab. When a transfer technician completes a project and needs a new one, if there isn't a pending request in the queue from the patron or curator, they simply have directions to look at the assessment and choose one that has an, a value of eight or above total rating on the preservation prioritization scale. When all those are exhausted, we will look to all the 7.5s and so forth. It has allowed us to create a workflow that ideally can manage itself as much as possible. <clears throat> as this webinar series implies, this entire venture is a work in progress. We are still ironing out how we best update our metadata. In the actual transfer of the content, we are finding that a significant amount have incorrect identification, labeling, dates, and so forth. The post-digitization process and the expectations of who will update this metadata and how to discern which is authoritative are something we are still working out. But this process has given us actual problems to work through and address. With a critical mass of actual files and situations to address, we hope to develop robust procedures. Furthermore, to facilitate the initial processing of collections and not have things simply described as take six, in metadata, we are trying to integrate AV digitization into the processing of new collections as they are acquired. Of course, we have a century of backlog as well, so we are trying to balance these workflows and project streams. Oftentimes, new acquisitions might even be more fragile because their storage situation hasn't been as kind as ours to our legacy holdings. By beginning the work, and adjusting mid-process, we left some inconsistencies in our initial survey, and we need to circle back through this assessment to get things consistent. Certainly, we have also found that materials were missed in the initial survey. Every few weeks, we find some AV materials that were not on the assessment. My goal is for this process to be iterative and even become a fixed component of the annual shelf free. We have developed a method of verification and discovery of missed materials and are just now putting it into practice. Thankfully, the assessment can be ever updated. It is a living document rather than a static report and requires no software development to enact changes. I'm consistently tweaking and updating the assessment myself as we discern new needs we wish to, it to address. There is work and refinement yet to be done. My rubric for risk assessment has shortcomings. One glaring example is that the identification of the subsets of grooved gramophone discs has proven too difficult for student identification. The fragility of these various types ranges significantly, but for expediency, I have assigned one risk value for all variants of these, including LPs, which are really quite materially stable and are not near obsolescence due to, to, to a revival in their popularity. Recordable discs, called transcriptions, acetate, lacquers, and so forth, are much more fragile than pressed LPs or coarse groove discs. Also, older discs from eras when the technology wasn't as standardized require specialized players that have speed variation and swappable stylus sizes. So I have notions to try and introduce more variation, but I'm still working through how to do this most efficiently. Whether this is something I want to add to the AV specialist's plate or if it is a task I will reserve for myself, maybe one year that is all I will have the AV specialist do is become adept at disk identification and then clean up the survey of our disk holdings. Curators are busy and it will require time to have each collection evaluated for content. My vision is that as we continue to witness the positive results of our digitization and the demonstrated value of the digitized files, everyone will become more invested. In the meantime, we can feel assured that what we are working on is valuable and prioritized, even if we don't have all these, assessed, all these things assessed yet. So once more, just a quick run through of the risk value matrices. I have them separated between audio and video, as you can see, and I gave myself a little bit of a key on the right for material obsolescence just to try and keep myself consistent as I looked over these, how 
really uh, truly obsolete is it and what value would I give that for a, an idea? Then also looking at the material and trying to think uh, <clears throat> how I can be consistent across my evaluation of these. A lot of times uh, two formats will, will have about the same thing, which is the audio cassettes that are digital, those DATs or the DCAS, which are just various formats of digital audio cassettes. Um, <clears throat> But this is what we have. And like I said, we uh, adapted it to our own standings uh, that are particular to our institution. Once more, just a quick run through of the assessment worksheet. I know this is small and maybe hard to see, but I wanted to see, to demonstrate how it flows out to the right, where uh, <clears throat> when we have a collection that we need to add because we find it, we can just add a new row and then tabulate what format it is in those format keys that you see in columns T through V. And then it's just tabulated at the bottom so that as these are updated, uh, they just automatically keep up with what we're doing. I hope this report of what we have done is helpful. Please also see my article for a slightly different approach on this exact project. I didn't want to just read my article, and so I have used this webinar to present on this topic in a bit of a different way. I want to thank OCLC again for this opportunity to present our work and hope it may be of help to others. That's it. <laughs> thank you so much, Ben. It was terrific. Um, so, folks, I encourage you to put uh, any questions that you have um, in the in the chat, um, and uh, then I'll start with um, a question that I, I think a lot of folks are probably interested in, and that is, is, is you, the risk assessment that you've put together available anywhere? Um, it currently isn't, but I'm certainly happy to share it. Um, I don't know exactly where I would put it, so uh, let me figure that out, and I'm more than help, well, well willing to, to put that up somewhere. Terrific. Um, and uh, so next question, Kate Dundon asks, um, so thank you, Ben, and asks, did your survey initiate reappraisal of any of your collections, or do you anticipate that it will? Absolutely, because I think, you know, maybe there was something collected under another curator, and so now a new curator is looking at it, and they didn't even know they had it. Um, you know, that, that occurs, and so someone might say, oh, this is really valuable. Or just because, you know, before we couldn't handle a lot of the AV stuff, and now that we're expanding our capability to do that, um, someone might say, well, this is actually, you know, content that's, that's more valuable than we anticipated. So I'm sure it will, uh, or we might, as we look at things and we're, and they're, the curators are assigning those, uh, those values of, of how rare the materials are, we might find that we have a collection of kind of commercially available recordings and maybe that seemed really singular in in the 90s when when media was you know so tied to its physical material but you know it might be com more more commonly available now and so then it might be devalued in its assessment and reappraisal as, as well great thanks um uh i'm curious uh I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about what you prioritized for in-house digitization um, and how you thought about what you know what you wanted to include in your lab, and versus what you wanted to send out to vendors. Yeah, so you know we're still in the first stages with the lab, so it was kind of what we had on hand, and we had the most ubiquitous formats and the most common formats that we were able to uh, digitize. That was um, you know quarter-inch audio tape and audio cassettes. Those also are robust enough and consistent enough formats that um, I could train students to do those. Um, but we're still building out, you know, the uh, the format that we have the most of, which is gramophone discs. Um, and so we're working on, on getting that station running. So, you know, it's really kind of alchemy and, and, and there's a lot of factors that go into it about what we already have, um, how many things we have with those numbers, but it's just really nice to base all that on data and say, well, we have a lot of these gramophone discs and a lot of transcriptions, so we it makes sense for us to invest 
in a turntable setup that's going to give us the variety to play those all back. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, you know, and time and, and money are just things you always have to consider, but we're working towards those things and we can base these decisions upon data. Great, thank you. Um, so then the next question is from um, Kimberly Tarr at NYU, and she says, thanks so much for your thoughtful presentation, Ben. I have two questions. Uh, my first question may be pretty granular, but I wonder if you could walk through the path to your storage estimates. Um, what are your destination file formats, and how did you arrive at those storage proje projections? Yeah, so <clears throat> once again, you know, I needed to present this report, and the sooner the better. So it was kind of, uh, I just counted each item and assumed that it had um, an hour of recorded time on it. I knew that I'd have some VHS that could be super long play and have eight hours on them, but a lot of times you have some tapes that only have, you know, 10 minutes on them. So just kind of an hour per item. Um, so an hour per item and then looking at the different format costs because uh, then I could come up with hours per format. And so then when I went to the, the vendors, I said, okay, if I had you know, this many hours, and, and that also then I could say, okay, my preservation target format hold is this many megabytes per hour on on on, a, on average, you know, for a wave or, or, or the various format we were preserving, and so I could extrapolate from that. So, yeah, it's, you know, there's, there's going to be some difference when it comes out in the real world, but at least that gave us a place to start. That makes sense um, and sort of sticks with the ethos of the larger project, right? Um, so Kim's second question, uh, she says, secondly, how has the collection level content value matrix worked out for your institution once you begin preservation? I'm thinking about mixed collections that contain commercially available content plus unique materials. Yeah, so when, you know, so we'll, yeah, we give that a value and sometimes we pull that container, you know, uh, of a collection and we find that half of it is, you know, has some, some commercially available things. And so, yeah, you know, that, that is some granularity we could add because maybe the students in there in, in doing the assessment could identify those. Um, but it's often kind of hard because, uh, you know, people will record off air things and so it'll look like, a, a, recording. So we're just kind of handling those in digitization. So we're using gross numbers to uh to to run our prioritization and things like that. But you know then when you when you pull it and you actually get it into digitization then you can kind of weed out those. So hopefully that'll that'll um, help us to have things smaller than our are anticipated and usually people aren't too upset when you when you don't have quite as much space as you needed. Um, great. And then uh, Kate Dundon asks, how do you plan to maintain your inventory over time as new collections are acquired? Will the person accessioning the new collection be responsible for adding to this, or will you maintain it? Yeah, so I'll, I'll work with collections uh, management, and when something shows up, you know, and now it's on the shelves, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll keep a record of where that is, but we just have on that shelf read um, what we have is kind of a box that says the AV has been verified, um, and so then they know they don't. People don't have to recheck that in the, in the following year's shelf read that the AV has been verified, so that they can move quickly through it and not have to feel like they have to count recount the same items every year. Because yes, the stacks are always moving around and changing, um, and uh, <clears throat> I mean not not rapidly, but they they do migrate like a glacier or something. So. You know, I'll work with collections management. When they move things, they just uh, we just update the, the AV assessments. And with it being such kind of malleable software, where we can you know copy and paste things rather than trying to, to update something that's more uh, locked in, then it allows us a lot of flexibility and ease. Thanks. Um, and I'm wondering if you um, you started to talk about this a little bit, but I'm I'm wondering how this digitization workflow and the kind of high level work that you're doing in the inventory impacts um, 
arrangement and description work, uh, you know, in that that might sort of descript like descriptive work that might be needed for digitization or that could occur after digitization. Yeah, we really uh, now we we kind of try and kick all the descriptive work till post digitization, which is ideal. Um, you know, there's I guess there's discussion on if something's misspelled on the outside of it, do you take that? But you know. Um, often when you start the video, you see the actual title, and that would be the, the official title that we would put in our metadata. So, yeah, we're, we're coming up with kind of, you know, workflows and ways to manage that because, you know, things change, um, or a lot of it's just more things explode. Uh, what I mean by that is you had one recording and there was kind of one label on it in our, in our description field, and then you find out that there's multiple recordings on that carrier. And so all of a sudden that that one carrier is associated with, you know, six different pieces of intellectual content and how to kind of, uh, you know, stretch that out and, and create those records that, that, that lead back to that. So it's, it's not easy, but I really like having real life examples and we're coming up with really robust then uh, approaches to how to hand those, handle those, you know, rather than sitting in a room and kind of deliberating, well, what about this and what about that? Um, with, where we can just base it all on, on, on the actual things that are coming in and, and we just write down in all our procedures. Great, thanks. Um, I think we have time for one last question and, uh, and it's from Marilee. And she asks, that she's curious if during COVID there's been more of an opportunity to digitize this coll these collections or if attention has been elsewhere. Yeah, that's hard because you have to physically be coming in to digitize things. It's not something you can do remotely. Um, you know, we can monkey with the AV assessment remotely. And so students, uh, you know, who, who needed to be home, um, you know, could, could work on kind of that end. They could be looking through and just earmarking all of those that had uh, a, an eight composite value for, uh, for total prioritization you know, um, and kind of putting those in a queue saying, now it's even easier. You don't have to go to the AV, preser you know, to the AV assessment. We kind of have them queued up um, by format. So, you know, they could work on those things, but to physically take a tape and to transfer it, you have to be uh, able to come in. And so that's been challenging, you know, in us uh, trying to work the, the workstations where it used to be that the students would share workstations and, you know, do kind of shift work on them. Um, and, and we don't want to spread things. So it's been both a challenge, but it's helped us get ahead on, on, on a lot of our, you know, things that we could do remotely, so. Great, thank you. Um, I think we're just about at the time, so I'm gonna turn it back over to Marilee here. Great question, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Oh yeah, thank you so much for all the interactivity. Really appreciate it. Um, I, it always, I think, helps keep things lively when we've got an ongoing um, discussion. So thank you so much for all of that. Um, we really appreciate your attendance and participation in this webinar. Uh, we will be posting, as I mentioned up top, we'll be posting a recording of this webinar up online and we'll notify you by email when that recording is available. And so I want to thank you for joining us today and this concludes today's webinar.